Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the um, first neurology grand rounds that we're back to uh, for the year. Um, we'll just start right on time today. Um, and uh, let me just pull up my introduction. Sorry. Oh, here it is, okay. Um, so welcome everyone. This is uh, Dr. Uh, Senya Kastanenka. Uh, she is an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she got her bachelor's in science with honors in psychology from SUNY Buffalo, and then did her PhD in neurosciences at Case Western Reserve University, working under Dr. Lynn Landmesser. She then went to be a research fellow here at Mass General, working with Dr. Brian uh, uh, Sai and continued on as lecturer, instructor, and then assistant professor. Uh, she runs a research lab at Mass General Hospital with an emphasis on neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's disease. And her lab focuses on circuitry disruption during the disease progression and mechanisms of action of Alzheimer's therapeutics. She has over 15 years of experience studying neural circuits. And during her PhD, she used uh, state-of-the-art laboratory techniques including optogenics to study the assembly of spinal circuits during development. And here at Mass General and Harvard Medical School, she has developed a line of work applying optogenics and multi-photon microscopy to dissect the role of sleep-dependent brain rhythms um, and how they play a role in the etiology and progression of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Kastanenka. Great, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see the slides. So as John mentioned, I'm an assistant professor here at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And the title of my talk today is Optogenetic and Therapeutic Approaches to Slowing Alzheimer's Disease. So in my laboratory, we perform a lot of high resolution multiphoton microscopy to generate images like this. Here through a window into a mouse brain, we can see blood vessels labeled in red, neurons are labeled in green, and here's a cell body, neuronal cell body. And this particular mouse is a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. It already started depositing amyloid plaques and here is individual amyloid plaques can be visualized in blue. Here are our disclosures. So here at Massachusetts General Hospital, we think a lot about the delicate balance between health and disease. What are the elements that tip the scale towards disease and how can we reverse these? The disease of interest in my laboratory is Alzheimer's disease. It is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder that is a major cause of dementia. It is characterized by the position of extracellular amyloid plaques, shown here in green. These are composed of amyloid beta. There are also intracellular inclusions, hyperphosphorylated uh, tau neurofibrillary tangles. There's significant cell death that occurs as part of the disease progression that can be appreciated when we compare Alzheimer's disease brain to that of a control individual. In addition to these major hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, more subtle changes have recently been elucidated. And those include disruption of intraneuronal calcium. So here we're gonna look inside the neuronal cells and see what the calcium concentrations are as part of the disease progression. And in the laboratory of my postdoctoral advisor, Brian Baskey, here at Massachusetts General Hospital, we discovered that there is a small yet vulnerable neuronal population that exhibits calcium elevations, what we call calcium overload. And we're going to discuss that in a little bit more detail later. In addition to calcium overload, there's substantial neuroinflammation in the brain that is activation of non-neuronal cells, such as microglia and astrocytes. 
Today, I will be discussing two studies. The aim of the first study was to determine if optogenetic targeting of sleep-dependent brain rhythms alters Alzheimer's disease neuropathophysiology in APPS1 mice and mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. And we're going to be monitoring these state-dependent brain rhythms in the mouse brain using wide field microscopy with voltage sensitive dyes. So I'm going to try to convince you that there are these oscillations of activity that originate in part of the brain and spread and then subside. The aim of the second study we're going to discuss is to determine if treatment with aducanumab anti-amyloid beta antibody leads to plaque clearance and restoration of neuronal calcium homeostasis in TG2576 mice. You probably heard in the news that aducanumab or aducelm was recently approved by FDA. And I'm going to discuss a collaborative study that we conducted with Biogen with the antibody, where we looked at the amyloid plaques before antibody treatment and then after. So on to the first study. In addition to memory disturbances, Alzheimer's patients exhibit sleep disruptions. They have difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. Here we're looking at the activity pattern, basically locomotor activity of an individual Alzheimer's patient. And as you can see, this individual was particularly active in the hours of the night. So what happens is Alzheimer's patients have difficulty uh, staying asleep during the night and they take frequent naps during the day that disrupts their circadian rhythms. So slow oscillations are these oscillations that occur during deep non-REM sleep, stage four sleep. And these were originally characterized by Mercia Steriad and then later characterized by Igor Timofeyev, who is our collaborator. In a series of three back-to-back -back Journal of Neuroscience papers, these slow oscillations were described as a novel slow oscillation of neocortical neurons. And these oscillations occur at the frequency of less than one hertz, which is in the delta range. Slow oscillations were later determined to be driven by a thalamic cortical circuit. And these are important for memory consolidation during sleep. And that is exactly the reason why we got interested in slow oscillations, because in the context of Alzheimer's disease, not, not only do patients exhibit uh, memory disturbances, but also sleep disruptions. And we thought that perhaps um, slow oscillations could uh, give us an insight into how that happens. So what do slow oscillations look like? Slow oscillations can be monitored in the humans as these alterations between up and down, up and down, up and down states over a period of time. These slow oscillations occur several times per night as patients sleep, um, especially when they're in deep uh, non-REM sleep. Slow oscillations can be monitored in the cat using electrophysiology. But what we are doing is we're monitoring slow oscillations using voltage sensitive dyes in the mouse cortex. So what we do is we apply voltage sensitive dyes directly to the mouse brain and what happens is these voltage sensitive dyes bind to plasma membrane and convert the change in voltage into change in fluorescence that can be then visualized as these propagating waves of activity up and down the right cortex and the left cortex. So slow oscillations were determined to originate in the anterior part of the cortex and propagate posterior as well as to the contralateral side. And as you will see in my subsequent slides, that is something that we took advantage of in our studies. So we monitored slow oscillations in healthy, non-transgenic wild-type mice using voltage-sensitive dyes. And here is a single wave that I already showed you. And we see these robust alterations between up and down, up and down state. So how are slow oscillations generated on the circuit level? So we think, if we think about the circuit in terms of excitatory neurons, 
uh, shown in circles and inhibitory neurons shown in squares. There's spontaneous activity. So a single neuron fires shown in red and then another excitatory neuron fires and then an inhibitory neuron fires until the neurons reach a certain threshold called network threshold. And that basically incites, excites the entire network. At that point, network, uh, once network to reach the threshold, it leads to depolarization of the membrane potential. And that elicits an episode of vigorous bursting activity within the cortical neurons. And that is, um, epi this episode of activity is translated in the upstate of the voltage sensitive dye image. Then after episode of activity is done, the membrane is hyperpolarized and that sets that um, period of network depression where another episode cannot be elicited until another episode is elicited and so on. And hence we continue seeing these intermittent episodes of activity in our case at the frequency of 0.6 Hertz in a mouse. So that's what we are seeing here in the healthy wild type mice. Yet when we monitored slow oscillations in a transgenic mouse of Alzheimer's disease, APP mice that harbor the Swedish mutation in the amyloid precursor gene and Delta A9 mutation in the personillin gene, it is a mouse model of amyloidosis, these mice deposit amyloid plaques, we saw that these oscillations looked very, very different. And was, this was really baffling to see early on. So we wanted to try and figure out what it is that is different be, um, um, as, as, as it came to slow oscillations in APP mice compared to that in the wild type that remains. And how long did that, uh, how early on did that dysfunction occur? So we started with very young animals. We compared them at two months of age. Uh, we compared the wild type and APP mice. We ran Fourier transform analysis. And that gave us power versus frequency parameters of the oscillatory cycle. And we didn't see many differences here, actually. The power, as well as the frequency of slow oscillations was comparable for the wild type and APP mice. However, starting at three months of age, compared to the wild type animals, we saw a significant decrease in the power which is proportional to the amplitude of the wave um, while the frequency was maintained in APP animals. We saw this at three months of age and then four months of age and then five months of age when amyloid plaques started to be developed, uh, deposited as well as six months of age after plaque deposition. Thus the power of slow oscillation was decreased while the frequency was maintained. So what is happening here at this early uh, stage is three to four months before plaque deposition? Well, as it turns out, there is already substantial oligomeric amyloid beta present at these early stages. And that is exactly what we figured out that is disrupting slow oscillations. So what is essentially happening is the APP mice are still cycling at the slow oscillation frequency, albeit at a lower power. So since we were using a transgenic mouse, uh, an overexpression model essentially, we wanted to verify that it was the amyloid beta that was diminishing the power of slow oscillations. To that end, we took a wild type mouse, we performed craniotomy, and we monitored slow oscillations in its cortex, and we saw robust alterations between up and down states, as you have already seen. Then we applied transgenic condition media that is enriched with amyloid beta. And we saw that the power of slow oscillation was decreased, as can be seen here in the uh, power versus frequency uh, graph. And we saw that the power was decreased, again, while the frequency was maintained, very similar to what we saw in our genetics. To gain insight into what is happening within the circuitry um, that is responsible for disruption of these oscillations, 
we took APP mice and we verified that the power is diminished. And then we actually applied GABA, which is an inhibitor and neurotransmitter directly to the brains of these mice. And we saw that the power of slow oscillations was restored. We also verified that GABA was indeed low in APP mice, in the cortices of these mice using immunohistochemistry. And then we verified it with more sensitive measures, such as HPLC. In addition to deficits in GABA, APP mice exhibit deficits in GABA-A and GABA-B receptors. Thus, there is a deficit in inhibitory tone, and hence the circuit is hyperactive. And that is the reason why slow oscillations are disrupted. So next, we wanted to answer this question. Do slow wave activity disruptions contribute to Alzheimer's progression? There were two possibilities, right? The first was that slow oscillation disruption is actually symptomatic of Alzheimer's disease. It's simply an epiphenomenon of the disease. The second possibility is that disruption of slow oscillations act actively contributes to the disease progression and hence should be targeted with therapeutics. To answer this question, we needed to de uh, determine whether there is a causal relationship between slow oscillations and Alzheimer's progression using a mouse model. We used optogenetics to do so. The, aim, the first aim was to determine if optogenetic treatment restores disrupted slow oscillations and slows Alzheimer's disease neuropathophysiology in our mice. The method of choice was optogenetics that was developed uh, by Carl Dyseroth, Ed Boyden, and Stefan Herlitzer. For those of you who haven't heard, this is a light-sensitive cation channel, such as channel rhodopsin, that can be expressed in a cell of interest. It can be targeted to specific cellular populations. And then once it's expressed and blue light is introduced to this channel, this leads to flow of ions down their electrochemical gradient. Thus, when the light is on, this leads to depolarization of the membrane potential of the cell that expresses it and firing of that neuron. So if we were to express channel rhodopsin in the cortical neurons that are responsible for transition between down to up state, we would essentially be able to synchronize neuronal activity with these brief flashes of blue light at a specified frequency. Thus, channel rhodopsin allows driving electrical activity of neuronal networks non-invasively within intact neuron brains. And that is exactly what we did. So we express channel rhodopsin in the cortical neurons or just the marker itself and cherry as a control. And then with brief flashes of blue light, we're able to restore slow oscillations in our APP animals. As soon as the light was turned off, the slow oscillation activity resumed its disrupted state. Thus, we were able to restore the power of slow oscillations while maintaining its frequency. And then subsequently, at the end of the experiments, we would always verify on cherry expression. So once we figured out that slow oscillations can be driven with light activation of channel rhodopsin, that the circuit can keep up, we performed this uh, chronic treatment experiment. We started with three-month-old APP mice. If you recall, that is the age when slow oscillations are first disrupted. We expressed channel rhodopsin in the anterior left cortex and we expressed a ratiometric calcium sensor, yellow chameleon 3.6. And I will explain how yellow chameleon works in subsequent slide. We expressed these in three month old animals, allowed the viruses to express, and then performed craniotomy, voltage sensitive dye imaging to verify that slow oscillations are indeed disrupted. And we would install a cannula 
over the injection site where channel rhodopsin is expressed to be able to introduce blue light to the neurons that express channel rhodopsin. Thus, we had a craniotomy installed over the site of our aratiometric calcium sensor, and we would be able to image amyloid plaques as well as yellow chameleon using multi-photon microscopy. And cannula was installed over the channel rhodopsin site. And then starting at four months of age, we performed chronic light treatment to restore the power of slow oscillations at the, at the normal frequency. That chronic light treatment lasted for 30 days. By the end of the treatment, the animals were five months of age, at which point we performed multi-photon microscopy imaging through cranial windows. We would inject methoxy XL4 prior to imaging. It would be injected IP. It would cross the blood-brain barrier and bind to the amyloid plaques in the brain. So we would be able to image plaques and a ratiometric calcium sensor. And then we would repeat imaging again at six months of age. Again, we would re-inject methoxy to be able to detect newly deposited amyloid plaques. And then we would image um, again. And the working hypothesis was that chronic treatment with light activation of channel rhodopsin would not only restore slow oscillations in APP mice, but also lead to slower plaque deposition, as well as normalization of calcium homeostasis. So how does our ratiometric calcium sensor work and why do we need it? So we would monitor extracellular amyloid plaques as a result of optogenetic treatment. However, amyloid plaque deposition doesn't correlate with cognitive decline. So we wanted a readout, a functional readout of neuronal health. And to that end, we used yellow chameleon, which is a ratiometric calcium sensor. It would allow us to determine the absolute basal calcium concentration within the neurons. The way yellow chameleon works is it has two fluorophores, CFP and YFP, and the ratio can be converted directly into the absolute calcium levels. Kishor Kuchibotla, a graduate student in the uh, laboratory of my postdoctoral mentor, Brian Baskey, first determined that APP mice have that small yet vulnerable neuronal population with calcium elevations. So here we're looking at neuronal processes in a healthy wild type animal, and we're looking at neuronal processes in the brain of APPS1 mouse. As you can see, majority of the neuronal processes are actually shown in blue. They're color coded according to the basal calcium concentration. And normally, neurons like to maintain their intracellular calcium within a very tight range, about 100 nanomolar. And that is necessary for healthy neuronal function. So all of the neurons shown in blue are healthy. They're considered to have normal levels of calcium. Similarly, in APPPS1 mice, you have quite a few neurons with uh, normal levels of calcium. However, there are these orange and yellow neurons that have calcium elevations. And that is shown here in this histogram. So we define a threshold over which a neuron is thought to have calcium overload. Thus, wild type animals have few to no neurons with calcium overload. Actually, it's a very small percentage, 2.2% of all neurons. And then the APPPS1 mice uh, Kishore showed that there's close to 20% of these neurons with calcium overload. Michal Arbel and Eloise Hudry later verified that it is oligomeric amyloid beta that is responsible for calcium elevations. They applied transgenic condition media that is enriched with amyloid beta and saw that calcium overload goes up with the neurons. So what we did 
In our study, we expressed channel rhodopsin in the anterior left cortex, and we expressed yellow chameleon in the posterior right cortex. The reason we did it is because we didn't want to study the neurons that express channel rhodopsin, because that would be an article. And we knew that if we elicit its slow oscillations here in the anterior part, where slow oscillations are usually, uh, usually originate spontaneously, these slow oscillations would then propagate down the cortex and into the contralateral hemisphere. So here is the data. We are looking at a field of view that was acquired with multifoton microscopy in an APP mouse at five months of age, and then at six months of age. There are three amyloid plaques present here, and here exact same amyloid plaques. Yet uh, in this particular mouse, we see the position of additional plaques. And that is to be expected because this APP mouse was not treated with light activation of channel rhodopsin. Since this is a progressive amyloidosis model, Amyloid, uh, the position of additional amyloid is to be expected. So what did we see when we restored slow oscillations with light activation of channel rhodopsin? We saw amyloid plaques present. However, we didn't see the position of additional amyloid. The number of plaques formed was significantly higher in APP animals compared to those treated with light activation of channel rhodopsin that was used to restore slow oscillations. An amyloid plaque burden, which takes into account not only plaque number, but their size, was also increased in APP mice that were not treated compared to the treated animals. Thus, restoring slow oscillations halt amyloid plaque deposition in APP mice. So then we looked at yellow chameleon. And as Kishore found years ago, APP mice have neurons with normal levels of calcium, shown here in blue. And there are neurons that have calcium overload within their processes and within their cell bodies. So what happens if we restore slow oscillations? Well, in this case, we had a really hard time finding neurons with calcium overload. As you can see, majority of the neurons are blue. They have normal levels of calcium. Thus, calcium overload was significantly higher in animals that were not treated with light activation of channel rhodopsin versus those that were. Thus, restoring slow oscillations prevents neuronal calcium elevations in APP mice. Thus, here, using light activation of channel rhodopsin, we were able to restore the delicate balance between health and disease by. Um, restoring slow oscillations. Not only did we do that, but we also saw that restoring slow oscillations really ameliorates Alzheimer's disease progression in these animals. So we're started, starting to uh, get an idea at this causal uh, relationship between slow oscillation disruption and Alzheimer's progression. Next, we wanted to determine whether increasing the frequency of slow oscillations would exacerbate the disease progression in mice. So in the first part of the talk, I mentioned that we wanted to restore slow oscillations to see if we can slow the disease progression. Slow oscillations are disrupted due to hyperactivity, hence exacerbating hyperactivity would facilitate the disease progression. And that is exactly what we tested here. To exacerbate hyperactivity, again, we decided to use optogenetics to double the frequency of slow oscillations. And we saw that the circuit could indeed keep up with that increased frequency of slow oscillations. The frequency was doubled with light activation of channel rhodopsin. And here, um, we worked together with Shuko Takeda, um, who was a postdoctoral fellow with Brad Hyman at the time. And he developed the technique of in vivo brain microdialysis, which is really, really exciting. So he would implant a microdialysis probe directly into the cortex of mouse brain. 
And then through the syringe, he would pump an artificial cerebrospinal fluid directly into the cortex. And then he would collect interstitial fluid that is rich with metabolites. He would collect it into the samples on the hour. And then we would monitor amyloid beta levels within these samples. Not only did we perform microdialysis in these animals, but we also installed an optical fiber over the site where channel rhodopsin was expressed. So here's the site of microdialysis probe. Here's the site of channel rhodopsin expression that was verified with a cherry marker later on. And this way, we would be able to alter or double the frequency of slow oscillations and monitor what happens to amyloid back levels, uh, sorry, amyloid, uh, oligomeric amyloid um, as we did so. Yes, we, we didn't monitor amyloid plaques here. We monitored um, oligomeric amyloid beta. So we had several samples before stimulation onset, and then we collected samples during the stimulation and then at the end of stimulation. And what we found was that amyloid beta levels increased during stimulation in APPPS1 mice and then decreased after stimulation offset. Similarly, in the wild type animals, we saw an increase in ISF A beta levels during stimulation. And here we're looking at the mouse A beta. And these levels decreased after stimulation offset. And that is something that is consistent with the literature because report, there, there have been reports that electrical activity is responsible for a beta production. Thus doubling the frequency of slow oscillations would produce more amyloid beta that could potentially deposit into more amyloid plaques. And to test that idea, we performed our chronic experiment Again, we took three-month-old APPPS1 mice. We expressed chenorhodopsin in the anterior left hemisphere, yellow, uh, yellow chameleon in the posterior right hemisphere, allowed the viruses to express, performed craniotomy over the yellow chameleon side, installed cannula over the chenorhodopsin side, and performed chronic light treatment at twice the normal frequency of slow oscillations. From four to five months of age, and then at nine months of age, we would perform multiphoton microscopy after injection of methoxy XO4. We would image amyloid plaques and yellow chameleon. And the working hypothesis was that increasing the frequency of slow oscillations by a factor of two, by chronic treatment with light activation of chanoidopsin would lead to elevated plaque deposition and increase the number of neurons as well as cell bodies with calcium overload. So here's the visual representation of our experimental setup. The power of slow oscillations is diminished in mice. In the first study, we would restore the power by um, light activation of chanorhodopsin at the normal frequency of slow oscillations, 1xRx. And here, we would double the frequency of slow oscillations. So we would drive it at 1.2 Hertz. So what did we find? Compared to the non-treated APP animals, we saw that the number of amyloid plaques was significantly increased when the slow oscillation frequency was doubled. And this is quantified here. Amyloid plaque number went up and so did amyloid plaque burden. Similarly, we saw an increase in the percentage of neurons with calcium overload um, when we compare non-treated APP mice to those whose slow oscillations were doubled. Thus calcium overload increased. And this effect was amyloid beta dependent because we didn't see 
um, a significant increase in the percentage of neurons with calcium overload in our healthy, um, non-transgenic all type metamates. As increasing the frequency of slow waves increases neuronal uh, cell number with calcium overload. So the conclusions so far are that slow oscillation power but not frequency is disrupted in AP mice and slow oscillations is this brain rhythm that is important for memory consolidation during deep non-REM sleep. A beta disrupts slow oscillation power while GABA restores it. Optogenetics can be used to manipulate the power and frequency of slow waves. Restoring slow wave power holds amyloid deposition and restores calcium homeostasis while increasing the frequency of slow waves actually increases a beta production and exacerbates neuropath physiology. Thus, targeting slow oscillation activity in Alzheimer's patients might prevent neurodegenerative phenotypes and slow the disease progression. However, maintaining the right frequency is of utmost importance. And here is um, a schematic that I borrowed from a review that we recently wrote with my graduate student, Evelyn Lee. So what happens in the context of Alzheimer's disease is non-REM slow wave sleep is decreased. That decreases slow wave activity, lymphatic clearance, and memory consolidation. That leads to elevations of amyloid beta and tau that further lead, uh, feed the vicious cycle of a decrease in non-REM slow wave sleep, decrease in slow wave activity, memory consolidation, and further elevations of a beta and tau. So how do we interfere with this vicious cycle? I showed you that in animal models of Alzheimer's disease, we can use up to genetics to restore slow wave activity and decrease amyloid beta levels, as well as restore calcium overload. Also, chemogenetics can be used in animal models. As for patients of Alzheimer's, with Alzheimer's disease, uh, TDCS or TMS stimulation modalities can be used to restore slow wave activity and potentially decrease uh, a beta or tau levels and or tau levels. Non-invasive stimulation paradigms such as acoustic or visual stimulation could also potentially interfere with um, slow wave activity, restore that slow wave activity and possibly restore memory consolidation. Does restoring normal circuit activity pattern is crucial for healthy neuronal function and when disrupted leads to disease. So now let's switch gears and talk about the second study, the aim of which was to determine if treatment with aducanumab and amyloid beta antibody leads to plaque clearance and restoration of neuron calcium homeostasis in yet another mouse model, TG2576 mice. This mouse model just has a single mutation, the Swedish mutation in the AP. So anti-amyloid beta immunotherapy showed great promise in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease a number of years ago now. However, the anti-beta immunotherapies such as selenezumab and pepinezumab failed phase three clinical trials. And that was very disappointing for the field. In comes in aducanumab. So how was aducanumab different? It is a fully human anti-A-beta monoclonal antibody as the other two were not. It was developed through reverse trans transcriptional medicine technology, and it was validated in vitro, in vivo, and it was recently used in clinical trials. The results of phase 1b clinical trial were reported in 2016. And it was really exciting time, actually. Um, our very own Brian, Brian Baskey told Fortune magazine that this is the most successful clinical trial in Alzheimer's disease ever. This was really exciting. So why were we so excited about this? It's because it was the first time that they showed a decrease in amyloid beta on a PET scan in treated patients compared to those that were treated with um, a control. And this effect was actually dose dependent, which was really promising. 
So we collaborated with Biogen to test their anti-beta antibody aducanumab in very old, 22-month-old TG2576 mice. What we would do is we would inject methoxy XO4, which again would cross blood-brain barrier and bind to amyloid plaques. We would perform craniotomy, durotomy, and topical antibody application. So we would apply antibody directly to the mouse brain. On the exact same day, we would perform our baseline imaging with multi-photon microscopy. So at this point, antibody was just applied and it hasn't gotten a chance to act yet. So this would be our first imaging session. And then we would allow our animals to recover and the antibody to act. And then three weeks later, we would image these animals again. And we would image amyloid plaques with multi-photon microscopy. The working hypothesis was that acute treatment with aducanumab would trigger amyloid plaque. So multi-photon microscopy can be used to monitor amyloid plaques, as I already showed. And here's just a video to bring that message home. We can see these individual plaques, and this mouse model is actually great at very old, old um, age because it has a really high number of amyloid plaques present in its brain. As you can see, um, these amyloid plaques are um, labeled with methoxy XO4, and there's some amyloid uh, present on the blood vessels as well. So when we applied aducanumab, we would generate images like this. Aducanumab was labeled with a red flag, and our uh, plaques are shown in green. So everything in yellow is really colocalization of antibody with amyloid. So this shows us target engagement. Antibody is able to find amyloid plaques. We saw this when we applied antibody directly to the brain, and we also saw this when we injected antibody IP. Uh, we saw that it crosses blood-brain barrier and engages its target. So here we're looking at methoxy XO4 positive plaques before and after antibody treatment. We saw amyloid plaque clearance, yet we didn't see uh, that antibody prevented deposition of new plaques. This antibody was effective in clearing plaques, but not preventing deposition of new plaques. And here again is the example of methoxy colocalizing with aducanumab. We used a control antibody that does not um, bind to amyloid plaques, as you can see here. And um, this antibody didn't clear amyloid. And that is quantified here. Aducanumab led to significant plaque disappearance. New plaque appearance was not affected. And amyloid plaque burden decreased. While well, in the case of a control antibody, it actually increased because these animals continued depositing amyloid plaques. So then we performed the chronic antibody treatment where we started with 17 to 18 month old due to 576 mice. We would express yellow chameleon and perform craniotomy right over the injection site. We would allow the virus to express, and then we would perform the first imaging session right after methoxy administration. So um, the first imaging session would be the baseline imaging session. And then right after that session, we would start administration of control or aducanumab, IP, at 10 mix per kg weekly. And that administration continued until after the last imaging session. So we continued imaging these mice at regular intervals up to close to six months. And we imaged our calcium reporter yellow chameleon. And the working hypothesis was that treatment with aducanumab would lead to normalization of calcium homeostasis. So we verified that indeed TG2576 mice have neurons with calcium overload, 
similar to Kishore Kuchibotla's work. And how do these neurons with calcium overload actually evolve? So here in the control treated animals, we saw these neuronal processes shown in red. And these actually persisted for three weeks. Actually, no, these, these, these persisted for months, for months, it was a longer time treatment. Um, so elevations in baseline calcium persist for a long time. In the case of aducanumab, in the cases where we started out with calcium elevations, we saw restoration of calcium homeostasis within these neurons. Does aducanumab immunotherapy restores neuronal calcium to control levels in our mice? And that restoration actually happened quite early on. Within two weeks, we saw a, a significant decrease in the percentage of neurons with calcium overload. And that percentage would continue going down as a result of drug treatment. Does neurites recovering from calcium overload was significantly higher in the aducanumab condition compared to that of a control. This treatment with aducanumab cleared plaques and restored neuronal calcium homeostasis. So this you probably heard, um, aducanumab, uh, Biogen performed a series of two clinical trials, Emerge and Engage. These were two identically designed phase three studies they enrolled patients with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease and mild AD dementia. All patients were screened with PET for elevated brain amyloid beta levels. So they knew what they started out with. That wasn't the case for other clinical trials for other different antibodies. Two out of three patients were EPOE carriers in each study, and they were well balanced across the arms. The primary endpoint was CDR square boxes at 18 months. So the dosing regimen was patients received either placebo, titrated low dose, or titrated high dose. The titrated low dose included EPOE for carriers at three mg per kg, EPOE for non carriers at six mg per kg. Titrated dose included EPOE4 carriers at 6 mg per kg and EPOE4 non carriers at 10 mg per kg. Only later did they submit an amendment, protocol amendment, to include EPOE4 carriers and at 10 mg per kg. And that's actually what led to the controversy and ultimately FDA approval of this drug. So, this is the timeline. Engage and Emerge started in August, September of 2015. The protocol amendment to include APOE4 carriers to titrate to 10 mix per kg was approved later. And in the spring of 2019, they performed futility analysis and they announced that uh, the drugs don't work. And ultimately, they uh, performed analysis of the larger data set that included additional data that became available after the pre-specified futility analysis. They met with FDA and the drug was approved. So here's the number of um, subjects that were included in the futility analysis in terms of emerge and engage. And as you can see in the largest data set, the numbers went up significantly. So the primary endpoint of ENGAGE was not met. However, the primary endpoint of EMERGE that included the larger da uh, data set was met. At the high dose, the patients showed uh, a significant uh, slowing of cognitive decline as um, assessed by CDR square boxes um, in actually both populations. They also monitored amyloid PET over time. And in the cases of eMERGE and ENGAGE, they saw similar results. 
they saw that in the placebo condition, the amyloid PET was um, increased or stabilized, while in the low dose, there was a decrease in amyloid PET in both emerge and engage. And in the high dose, there was an even further decrease in amyloid in the um, brains of these patients. And then ultimately FDA granted approval of um, adju aducanumab, uh, which is now aduhelm on the condition that biogen runs phase four clinical trial. And with that, I would like to conclude. I would like to acknowledge all the present and past members within my laboratory who contributed to this work. It really took a village to get these papers published. I would like to thank Dr. Merit Sukovic and Rebecca Williamson for the uh, invitation to speak here today, as well as the planners. Um, I would like to thank Carol for helping me organize, my mentors, Brian Baskey and Brett Hyman for their continued support. I would like to thank our collaborators um, at Biogen. And I would like to thank funding uh, without which this work would not be possible. And thank you so much for your attention. Right now, we'll take any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much for uh, the presentation, um, Dr. Kastanenka. Uh, I will read off um, questions and please feel free to send in questions um, uh, now as well. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Staley. Um, Yes, could you speculate as to why continuous GABA application is sufficient to restore slow wave sleep oscillations, but intermittent stimulation is required to restore slow wave sleep oscillations in APP mice? It would seem from your model of circuit dynamics that intermittent rather than continuous GABA would be required to restore slow wave sleep in APP mice. That's an excellent question. Thank you so much for that question, Dr. Staley. So we uh, applied GABA, uh, a single dose, directly to the brain of these animals. And then we monitored slow oscillations essentially within an hour using voltage-sensitive dyes. And we saw restoration of that power. Uh, we didn't go beyond the hour. Um, so my guess would be that the slow oscillations would resume their disrupted state. We haven't actually performed chronic treatment with, uh, uh, with GABA, for instance. Um, when it came to optogenetics, as you saw, we performed a month-long treatment. Um, so there was no, uh, the, um, because GABA, I would imagine, gets metabolized, right, pretty quickly in the brain. Um, but with optogenetics, we're able to maintain that slow oscillation power for long periods of time. Great. Um, another question uh, by from Dr. Brian Wenger. Um, he said, great talk, thank you. Uh, along similar lines, I'm curious if you've used chemogenetic techniques to resolve the effect of absolute firing versus timing. That's a great question, Brian. Yes, it would be a, a fantastic experiment to try, uh, especially when trying to translate these studies. Unfortunately, it's not something that we've done yet, uh, but it would be it would be great to, to try it out. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Senia Kastanenka, for joining us for the grand rounds. Um, and if uh, everybody has any additional questions, um, I'm sure Dr. Kastanenka would also be uh, happy to answer them uh, over email as well. But thank you, everyone, for joining us um, and uh, have a good rest of your morning. Thank you. Bye bye.